do want to welcome you today on this special day. It's not often that Sunday is actually on the 4th of July, but it is today. I want to wish everyone a very happy 4th of July. I appreciate Ken doing a really good job of picking out those patriotic songs that remind us of the incredible freedoms, opportunities, privileges, and abundance we have in this country. We take it for granted. I'm guilty. We think it's normal. It's not normal. It's never been normal. It's still not normal in the world today. So many people in the world right now would be oppressed for doing what we're doing. Uh, could be jailed, could lose a lot of their privileges, and maybe worse, for simply saying that we believe there is one God and we're here to worship and honor him, and he's the one that we give our loyalty and allegiance to. So we are blessed above all people to be able to be here today. I love this great verse. This is one of the great verses. I would highly encourage you to memorize this one from the book of Isaiah, chapter 66, verse 2. This verse tells us the people that God looks on with favor. And he says, these are the ones I look on with favor. Those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. And by tremble, he means we need to believe, trust, respect, honor what God's word says. And we would all admit we live in a country now that's gotten away from the original intention of our founding fathers who were believers in God. And we live in a culture that doesn't tremble at God's word at all. And sometimes we are affected by that. We need to make sure that we believe and trust God's word. And that's going to be especially true today. Today, because it's the 4th of July, you know I'm preaching through Luke's gospel. I'm going to depart from that for today, and we'll get back to the great teachings of Jesus next week. I'm going to say some things today, not my words. I'm the watchman, as was read this morning. I'm going to report what God has said as I read his word. If you are a politically correct person, I love you, but this sermon is not going to be politically correct. If you believe that preachers or teachers or Christians should not speak the truth of God's word, I'm giving you warning. I'm going to say it nicely and kindly, but I'm going to teach what scripture says. Uh, we have some incredible founding documents in this country. You see pictured here the Constitution of the United States adopted in 1789 and then the Bill of Rights two years later the first ten amendments to the Constitution adopted in 1791 and of course on this day July 4th 1776 the Declaration of Independence from the freedom of oppression from uh, King James in England these are some incredible incredible documents and I know you probably in school, you've been taught these things, and you maybe had to memorize the preamble to the Constitution and all those things, which I had to, and I can still remember some of it, but not all of it, you know. But I want to read just a little bit. The Declaration of Independence is actually not very long, signed by 56 people, but I want to read just a little bit of this and just listen to how our founding fathers, they had deep belief in God. Listen to some of the things uh, that they say here. This is in Congress. July the 4th, 1776. It says, this is the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with one another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Notice they didn't evolve. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And they go on and talk about the grievances they have against England. And then toward the end of the declaration, it says, We therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress, assembled appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions. And then they conclude by saying, And for the support of this declaration, with the firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. 
and 56 men sign it, among whom some names you would recognize, John Penn, John Hancock, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and as I was doing a little bit of research this week, most of the people who signed it were lawyers or plantation owners or scientists or doctors. There was one full-time minister. Hallelujah. And his name was John Witherspoon of New Jersey. Just some great, great things that they said. You notice how they mentioned God freely, leaders of our country. That's how our country was originally started. Listen to a couple of quotes from some of our forefathers as well. Our forefathers believed that these liberties that they talked about in the Declaration and in the Constitution, they believed that these liberties were granted to all by God as natural rights that couldn't be taken away by any government. Then they knew that if those individual liberties, like the freedom of religion, like we're doing today, the freedom to assemble, the freedom to have property ownership, if they knew that those things were ever going to be scaled back, they knew it was going to start with undermining the freedom of speech. Benjamin Franklin said, Whoever would overthrow the liberty of a nation must begin by subduing freedom of speech. George Washington and James Monroe, who was the fifth president, they said very similar things, though I won't take the time to quote them all. They knew that America would be on very shaky ground if the right of godly citizens to speak the truth were ever infringed upon. And so today what we're going to talk about a lot is we're going to talk about the freedom of speech and what Scripture says about that. But before doing so, I want to mention a book that I would highly recommend that I just finished reading. And I'm going to read a little bit out of it, a good little story. This is a book by Phil Robertson. You've all watched the Duck Dynasty, the Duck Commander, the one who started that whole deal. Remember the Church of Christ, lives in West Monroe, Louisiana. Good godly man, good godly family. He wrote a book here that I would highly recommend called The Theft of America's Soul, Blowing the Lid Off of the Lives That Are Destroying Our Country. And this comes from... Uh, page 173 to 176 of that book. He's telling a story. He says, I was sitting in my living room one day. Our home served as the duck commander office back in the original days. And when the phone rang, he answered the phone. He said, hello, duck commander, this is Phil. And a guy on the other end said, I need to get some duck calls, need to order some. Well, I asked him what he'd like, and he started in on his order, and he started listing the calls. And between each one of them, for whatever reason, he would use the Lord's name in vain. First once, then twice, then three times, and the fourth time he used Jesus' name. I knew what I had to do. First, he says, I need to get his email address and his credit card information. Next, I needed to ask him why he was so intent on cursing the Lord. And he asked this man, he said, let me ask you something. After I'd written down his MasterCard number, he said, why would you curse the only one who could save you from eternal death? And that caused the guy on the other end to pause and not really say much for a while. And eventually the receiver slammed down on the other side and he heard the dial tone. Well, 10 minutes go by and the phone rang again. And he answers the phone again. Hello, Duck Commander, this is Phil. And again, it was that familiar voice that said, and he, he told the, uh, Phil, asked this man, he said, well, what about it? Why would you curse the only one who could save you from death? That's the question on the table. And there was another moment of silence. And then he said, well, I've never really thought about it before. And then Phil took the opportunity over the phone. He said, well, you need to think about it. Because one of these days, like all of us, you're going six feet under. And you need to think about it. And then he said, you know what you ought to do? You ought to drive over to West Monroe, Louisiana, from where you're at there in Decatur, Alabama. And let me tell you a story. And when I'm finished, I bet you won't curse God anymore. And so they hung up. A week went by, he didn't hear a thing. But finally, he said he was sitting in his office there, the duck commander office in West Monroe in his living room, and a knock came on the door. And uh, he asked the people to come in. And the guy came in, had a buddy in tow, and he said, do you know who I am? And Phil said, I don't know you from Adam. He said, well, I'm that fellow on the phone that was cursing God, and I'm not leaving until you tell me why I shouldn't. And Phil said, well, friend, you've come to the right place. And there in my living room, I told the two gentlemen the good news of Jesus. And they listened closely. And about halfway through, they started bawling like little boys. 
And I finished, and then I asked whether they'd like to go down to the river to be baptized, to move on what they had just heard. And they said they would. So he took them down to the river, and he baptized both of them. And when I raised them up, I asked whether they needed any dry clothes for their six-hour trip back to Decatur. And they said, no, we're all good. So they left sopping wet and drove six hours back to Decatur, Alabama. Seventeen years later, Phil says, I found myself in Decatur, Alabama. I was scheduled to preach for a local church. He said, the truth was, I'd baptized so many people over the years that I didn't think twice about that boy and his friend who cursed God but then eventually obeyed him. That is, until I was at dinner with the preacher that night. And while we were eating, one of the brothers at the table asked if I remembered so-and-so, a name I didn't recognize, and I told him I didn't, and that's when he reminded me of this story. And he talked about how they had drove, driven all the way there and he'd baptized them, the one who had cursed his name. He said, you should know that he came home after that meeting at your place and he gave it to us real good for never sharing the gospel with him. He said he shouldn't have to drive from Decatur all the way to Louisiana to hear the gospel that we should have taught. And then Phil asked, he said, well, whatever happened to that guy? He said, he's one of our church leaders now. The man who had used his freedom of speech to curse the Almighty now used it to preach his name. It was kind of like a modern-day Saul to Paul conversion story. And the point he's making out of this, which is really good, there is power in the teaching of the gospel. When people like Phil and you and I, when we use our free speech, our God-given unalienable rights that are also stated in the founding documents of our country, when we do that, there is power in that to change the hearts and the lives of people, to set them on a completely different course, not only for this life, but also for eternity. And I think maybe that's one of the reasons that freedom of speech is under such attack. And it is, as I'll show. Because Satan knows the great power of the gospel to change the hearts and the lives of people. Look at this quote from the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. That is a law that is guaranteed to us, but this law that is the first of the ten amendments to the Constitution is under attack today. Let me just give you a, a few things to think about. America has basically done away with God in its consciousness. I don't have to give a bunch of evidence for that. I think that's pretty obvious. And so since they say there is no God, we've also fallen for the lie of Satan that freedom of speech shouldn't apply to religious free speech. Haven't we heard that? Because after all, Speech of Christians shouldn't be tolerated because when Christians speak speech, it's hate speech. Because when you point out sin, that's called hate speech. That is the lie that is being told in our country today. And I'm afraid that we've become kind of timid, and that's using it mildly, and we haven't exercised our right of free speech. So what does the Bible say about our God-given right and our constitutionally given right? of free speech and how it should apply today. Well, that's what we're going to look at. And that goes back to the scripture reading that John Rao did a good job of reading for us a moment ago. God called this great prophet Ezekiel and he raised him up to be the prophet of Israel, to be the watchman. The watchman's job was the one who was up on the wall in a lookout tower. And when he saw any kind of threat approaching, he was to speak out and to warn the people. But before he did that, there was something about the prophet, something about the watchman that he needed to do. And it was this, and this directly applies to everyone in here. I hope everyone will look and listen closely. He says, Son of man, eat what I am giving you. Eat this scroll. He means that metaphorically, of course. He means take it into your heart, absorb it. And then go and give its message to the people of Israel. And so I opened my mouth and he fed me the scroll. And he said, fill your stomach with this. And when I ate it, it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. 
Son of man, let all of my words sink deep into your own heart first, he says. Listen to them carefully yourself. Then go to your people in exile and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Do this whether they listen to you or not. Ezekiel was called by God to be a prophet, to be the watchman for the world. You and I are called today. We are called to be modern day prophets. We are the prophetic voice. I don't mean a prophet in the exact sense that Ezekiel was. You know what I mean. But we are to be the voice of God in this world today. And as you know, in America, the voice of God is not heard very much. But before we can speak the word of God, there's something you and I have to do first. We have to eat the word of God. And of course, you know, I mean that metaphorically. We need to make it a part of us. We need to regularly absorb it, and we need to regularly get it into our hearts and lives. If we don't do that, we have nothing more to tell people other than maybe to show them a word of kindness and our own human wisdom. We need to have the word of God in us before we can tell people what is wrong and warn them of the dangers that they are on. And I was reminded of this this week. You know, I have a lot, like you guys, uh, I have friends from the past that I still communicate with, with the modern uh, technology we have of text messaging, and I'm group text with some people that I know from Abilene and in Oklahoma and San Angelo where we used to live and other places, and these are all Christian people, and we communicate about lots of things, about football and about politics and this and that. Well, anyway, this, w this week, uh, one of my friends was texting myself and some of the other Christians on this text thread. And he was saying that today, this Sunday, his worship minister at his church where he goes in San Angelo, Church of Christ, had asked him to do the communion meditation and say the prayer like David Blaylock did a moment ago. He has never done this in his life, and he's old as me. He's led lots of prayers and done lots of things, but never done that. Well, he was taking it really seriously. That's why he was asking us. He was asking for some advice. What should I say? Which passages should I go to that are, you know, not the ones that we use all the time? And so a couple of people said, this is a good one, and this is a good one. I suggested one in Philippians. And uh, he said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about all this. Listen to what he said. I love how serious he takes it. He says, I'll be doing a lot of Bible study and reading and meditating over the next few days that I'm off to get prepared so this is all a good thing for me he says thanks for all the information and the help and then he said this anything that gets me back to cracking my Bible open is a good thing and that bothered me I'm glad he's taking it seriously and he is and I appreciate that but anything that will get me back to cracking my Bible open it takes that to get us to crack our Bible open but I'm serious we need to be people who let the word of God absorb into us on a daily basis. We need to eat it like Ezekiel says right here, like God tells Ezekiel. It needs to be something that is a part of us because without taking the word of God into our hearts and allowing it to saturate our minds and souls, as I said again, we have nothing more to offer people than our own human wisdom and our own advice. And as John Rowell read so well just a moment ago, what the watchman's duty was, he was to warn the people of imminent danger. When he sees it, his job is to warn them. His job was not to respond. If they didn't respond, he had done his part. He wouldn't be held responsible. But, and this is where we need to listen closely, when we know the truth from meditating on it and absorbing it and eating it, and if we don't use our freedom of speech to warn this culture God's going to hold us responsible that's what he goes on to say in this passage and in chapter 33 he repeats it almost verbatim and so I want you to look at some of the things that the New Testament says the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 1 that the wrath of God is revealed just right there talking about that a lot of people in this culture would be offended because our culture today, well, there, that's hate speech. Brothers and sisters, that is not hate speech. That's love speech. I'm quoting scripture. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. What is the wrath of God revealed against? Well, he tells us. It's revealed against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. There's a lot of suppression of the truth that was going on in the day of Rome. And wouldn't you agree that it's going on now? And they suppress it by their wickedness. And he is going to go on and he is going to enumerate 
a lot of wickedness. But before I get into that, let me remind you of something that you already know well. The book of Romans is a great book, and it's about salvation. How are people saved? We're saved through Jesus when we obediently put our faith and trust in him. Plainly, the book of Romans says that. But before he gets into that, which he doesn't start that until chapter 3, for the first two chapters, he warns people and he tells people what is wrong. People won't know what to repent of or what to be saved from. We talk about salvation. We live in a culture today. People don't know what to be saved from because people think sin is no big deal. And yet, look at what the Apostle Paul says at the beginning of this book. He is warning them. He says this. This is not politically correct, but it is biblically correct. God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. And as a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex, and instead they indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women... They burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty that they deserved. Everybody knows in this culture, especially about the last 10 years, this homosexual agenda is being rammed down our throat. Would everybody agree? And we're being told that this is normal. This is just an alternate way to do things. Look at God's words. This is shameful, vile, degrading. Not natural, it's not normal, shameful, and then he says once again, it is sin. Those are God's words, not my words. Brothers and sisters, we need to say that in a loving, kind way, but not back down from the truth. Our world needs to hear this because our world doesn't know right from wrong. Used to, you could assume that those days are gone. We are the watchman. We are the prophetic voice in this world. And then he says, he says this, Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people to be saved because I know what enthusiasm they have for God, but it's a misdirected zeal. Don't we all know there are a lot of people in this world who claim to be Christians, who claim to be members of church, but their zeal, they might be zealous, but it's very misdirected. There are churches, lots of them, all over the place. Who will the passage I just read a moment ago from Romans chapter 1, where God called these things shameful and vile and unnatural and not normal and sinful? People would welcome that and tolerate that in the name of diversity. Our culture is misdirected. Its zeal is greatly misdirected. So what do we need to do? He goes on to say... How can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they ask or hear about him unless someone tells them? That's a good question. It's our job to tell people we have freedom of speech. And God is calling us to be the watchman and to speak out in loving ways but directly and to not back down. The city of Ephesus. You've all read the book of Ephesians, I'm sure, but a little bit of background. You see right here the ruins of the Temple of Diana, or also called the, the Temple of Artemis, the great goddess Artemis, which supposedly fell down out of heaven. Of course, it was a, a big legend and a big myth. But in the name of worship to this false goddess, there were all kinds of heathen, ungodly, sexually immoral practices that were done in the city of Ephesus. This culture was as depraved, if not more depraved, than ours is, if you can imagine that. And in this culture, I want you to notice what Paul is inspired by God to say to them, to speak to them. Here's what he says. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and God. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. Then and now, there's a lot of people who are trying to excuse these things and say, oh, that's not going to, that's no big deal. 
Don't be fooled. This is a serious thing to God. So what do we need to do? Look what he says at the end of the book. Pray for me that whenever I open my mouth, words will be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Brothers and sisters, I'm afraid we become fearful. We're fearful of being sued. We're fearful of being called a bigot. Or we're fearful of being called narrow-minded or whatever. Or not going along with the crowd. We need to pray this prayer that Paul prays. Pray that God will give us the words we need to say to warn our culture. Because our culture is going off a cliff. Wouldn't we all agree with that? If you don't believe it, go to a movie, watch television. Get on the internet, anywhere. Listen to anything. It's evidence is all around us and we all know it. We just need to be reminded of our freedom of speech and that we need to warn people. One more bit of evidence. The city of Corinth. The city of Corinth, to put it in modern language, if you put Las Vegas and Miami together, that's about what the city of Corinth is like. You all know what the reputation of Las Vegas and Miami is like. My wife and I actually used to live in Miami in the 1990s, and there was a lot of neat places to go, but you can get in all kinds of trouble if you go to the wrong places in Miami. That's why when they made the television show out of it, they didn't call it Miami Nice. They called it Miami Vice for all kinds of reasons. Well, Corinth worshipped all kinds of false gods like Ephesus. They worshipped Aphrodite, Athena, Apollo, etc. But here you have pictured the ruins of and an artist's depiction of what they thought the temple of Aphrodite looked like back at that time. In the name of religion and in the name of worship to this false goddess of Aphrodite, this temple employed 1,000 temple prostitutes who would go out into the city at night and ply their trade with the men of Corinth all in the name of worship to these false gods. Now our country may not be quite that bad yet, but it's heading there in a hurry. And I want you to notice what God inspires Paul to say to that sexually immoral, ungodly culture, much like ours. He says this, Don't you realize that those who do wrong, yes, there is such a thing as right and wrong, they will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or male prostitutes or are thieves or greedy or drunkards or abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. He doesn't say, oh, these are just aberrations. They're just different. We should tolerate and accept that. It's not what he says. He uses his freedom of speech to stand up and to warn like a watchman, which is exactly what you and I need to do. And so once again, what do we need to do about it? Look what he says later in this book. I love this great passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. It's the message of the cross. It's the speaking of the message of the cross. Their culture needed to hear it. Our culture needed to hear it. I think if you're like me, and many of you in here, you know, have an older crowd today with a few exceptions. But, you know, I was born in the 1960s, grew up primarily in the 1970s. And there was a lot of God consciousness in the culture then. Those days are gone, brothers and sisters. You could rightfully assume them, and probably through the 80s, and I think somewhere in the 90s, we completely lost our ever-loving mind in this country. You could assume that there was some uh, fear of God and healthy respect for God then. You can't now. The message of the cross is foolishness, but that message needs to be taught now because people don't know it. And he goes on and he says, since God in his wisdom, he saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom. He has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. Brothers and sisters, preaching is mocked and it's ridiculed. And I don't just mean preaching like I'm doing right now. But anyone who dares to use their God-given right and constitutionally given right of freedom of speech... If you talk about the things of religion and the truth of God, the words I've shown today, you will be mocked and ridiculed in this country. But those words are powerful to change people's lives. And they need to be spoken. By me, by you, by wherever we are and whenever we find that opportunity. And so the thing that I'm trying to get across this morning on this 
wonderful Fourth of July in this free country with all the privileges and opportunities that God has given to us. We need to speak up for truth and not let it be suppressed. Truth is being suppressed. And brothers and sisters, if we ever lose this right of free speech, as our forefathers, I think, said in the statements I read earlier, those other freedoms that we are enjoy and are so blessed to have, like the freedom to peaceably assemble, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, those things, if we lose freedom of speech, we're likely to lose those things. And the best way we lose it is by us just being fearful and passive and not saying anything. We need to speak the truth in a loving way, but we need not to be afraid of what God's Word says and not go along with our ungodly culture. So the way I want to end this is I want to talk about God's grace for a second because hopefully when you're a preacher or a teacher, and you're teaching people who are in here this morning or will be at the second service or maybe who are watching online. You're hoping that the Holy Spirit's going to use his words that he's preserved for us. And they're going to touch somebody's life and somebody's going to be convicted. Maybe there is someone in here or someone watching online or someone who will happen upon our website who's going to see this and hear this. And maybe God's word will be convicted. Maybe they are guilty of some of the things that were enumerated in the list that Paul said, these are things that are ungodly and vile and you need to change from these or you'll experience the wrath of God. I hope someone's heart is convicted of that. But I want everybody to know this, and this is the way I want to end this with this great passage from 1 Corinthians. Right after Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, I had a list there earlier. We said, don't be deceived. Those who practice these sins won't inherit the kingdom of God. He says this, some of you were once like that. But you were cleansed, you were made holy, you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. There were people in the Corinthian church, he was saying, who were once guilty of practicing these very vile, sinful, unnatural, ungodly things that he enumerated. But here's the good news. There may be somebody in here watching online or in the second service that may be guilty as well. If you will repent and turn to God, he'll forgive you of everything you've ever done, no matter how bad it has been, and he will set you right in God's sight. Brothers and sisters, that is the good news. And I just hope and pray that maybe there will be somebody today in this service or the next service or watching online who will do that. Let's stand together as we sing this song of encouragement.